The Law of God by St. Philaret, chapter one. Conscience, the, the chapter is called Conscience and Moral Responsibility. Of all the beings inhabiting the entire earth, only man has an understanding of morality. Every person is aware that the actions of man are either good or bad, kind or evil, morally positive or morally negative, that is, immoral. By these concepts of morality, man immeasurably differs from all animals. Animals behave as is characteristic of them by nature, or else if they have been trained in the way they are taught. But they have no concept of morality and immorality, and so their behaviour cannot be examined from the point of view of moral understanding. By what means does one distinguish between the morally good and the morally bad? This dif differentiation is made by means of a special moral law given to man by God. And this moral law, this voice of God in man's soul, we feel in the depth of our conscience, consciousness, and it is called conscience. This conscience is the basis of morality common to men. A man who has never listened to his conscience, but stifled it, suppressed its voice with falseness and the darkness of stubborn sin, is often called unconscionable. The word of God refers to such stubborn sinners as people with a steered conscience. Their spiritual condition is extremely dangerous and can be ruinous for the soul. When a person listens to the voice of his conscience, he sees that this conscience speaks in him, first of all as a judge, strict and incorruptible, evaluating all the actions and experiences of a person. It often happens that some given action is advantageous to a person, or has elicited approval from other people, but in the depth of the soul, this person hears the voice of his conscience. This is not good. This is a sin. In a tight bond with this, with this action of judging, conscience also acts in a man's soul as a legislator. Um, a legislator for those who, whose English is not their first language is uh, someone who makes law, I think. So I'll say that sentence again. In a tight bond with this action of judging, conscience also acts in man's soul as a legislator. All those moral demands which confront a man's soul in all his conscious actions, for example, be just, do not steal, etc., are norms, demands, enjoinments of this very conscience. And its voice teaches us how one must and must not behave. Finally, conscience also acts in a man as a rewarder, this happens when we, having acted well, experience peace and calm in the souls and vice, vice versa, after having sinned, we experience reproaches of the conscience. These reproaches of the conscience sometimes pass over into terrible mental pain and torment and can lead a person to despair or to a loss of mental balance if he does not restore peace and calmness in the conscience through deep and sincere repentance. It is self-evident that man bears a moral responsibility only for those actions which he commits, firstly in a conscious condition, and secondly being free in the carrying out of the actions. Only then can moral imputation be applied to these actions, and then do they impute a man either guilt, praise, or judgment. On the other hand, people not recognizing the character of their actions, children, for example, children, those deprived of reason, for etc., or those who are forced against their will to commit such actions do not bear responsibility for their actions. Um, if it's confusing, don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna discuss all of this um, when we um, when we finish this chapter. In the epoch of the persecution against Christianity, the pagan tormentors often placed incense on the hands of martyrs and then held their hands over the fire burning on their altar. The torturers supposed that the martyrs would not endure the fire and would jerk their hands away, thus dropping the incense into the fire. In fact, these confessors of the faith were usually so firm in spirit that they preferred to burn their hands and not drop the incense. But even if they dropped it, who would charge that they brought sacrifice to the idol? On the other hand, a drunkard could not be held as free of responsibility since he began to become drunk while still in a normal and sober condition knowing very well the consequences of being drunk. Thus, in certain Northern European states, a person who commits a crime while in a drunken state is doubly, is doubly punished, both for having become drunk and for the crime itself. 
that the moral law must be acknowledged as innate to people, that is, fixed in the very nature of man, is indisputable. For this is bespoken by the undoubted universal universality in mankind of a concept of morality. Of course, only the most basic moral requirements can be accounted as innate, mor a moral instinct of a sort, but not, re not revealed in clear moral understandings and concepts since clear moral understandings and concepts devel develop in man through upbringing and influence from preceding generations, most of all on the basis of religious awareness. Therefore, coarse heathens have moral norms lower, coarser, more malformed than Christians who know and believe in the true God who placed the moral law into man's soul and who, through this law, guides all of, us, guides all of his life and activity. Okay, um, before we discuss this chapter, that's the end of the chapter, um, we're going to see if Vespita is with us and if there's anything that Ze Vespita wants to highlight or um, talk about from this chapter. I think it was very interesting that um, St. Philaret begins with um, the lack of um, moral responsibility that the animals have. We live in an age where um, dogs and cats and other, but mostly dogs and cats, have been uh, have become supposedly the best friends of people. Not in the friend, in the sense that uh, a dog's man's best friend, but actually that um, they sleep with them, they eat with them, they talk with them, they discuss with them. And I think that's because we don't want um, any moral challenges. Um, a dog or a cat will not, because it doesn't have a sense of morals, it will not challenge us in anything. It will not point out something wrong uh, in the way we live, nor do we, um, um, do we have to care what, the, what an animal might think, um, because it's, it's an animal and it will show us um, happiness, usually related to food, but anyway, that's another long story. Uh, uh, the sense of morals, the sense of true love uh, cannot be found in, in an animal. But unfortunately, um, part of the whole New Age movement, I believe, is the um, raising of animals on a pedestal to make them much better than people. Uh, uh, simply, they don't challenge us. Um, uh, they don't challenge us, yes. Uh, they don't make us... Um, shape up to to what a person should be like they don't question us they don't um imp impose their personality on us so we just make them uh, eat drink and uh, wag their tails for us and um, maybe not that important but um i did notice that uh, you, while we're on this subject the other day, could could your grace explain to us what the the danger is in in like the spiritual effect is or what are we missing out on when we try to make animals our friends and surround ourselves with animals like i'm going to stay at home and spend time with my dog rather than spending time with my family um what's the effect that this has on us we were all put on this earth to work out our salvation and the best way of working out our salvation is um to be, if I could use the expression, sandpapered by the things around us. And we are sandpapered when um, I wanna do this, but uh, my friend, my husband, my wife, my brother, my sister, the person I live with wants to do that. And that's where uh, the cutting of the will comes in. Um, mm. If you don't cut your will, you're not a good monk. If you don't cut your will, you're not a good wife or a husband or a father or a mother. There are, uh, We all have our times when we wouldn't like to do any of the things we do on a daily basis, but we do them um, because we have to cut our will and we have to uh, be um, made uh, soft and uh, shiny by um, the friction between each other um there's no friction in our relationship with animals we uh they don't um ask us to change our way of thinking and uh, we don't really have any useful discussion with them 
So we can just project onto an animal what we would really like, and that's why animals are are more important than people in today's society, unfortunately. Is that just to... literally... Sorry, Yarda. Yeah, some years ago, it had already started in Greece because Greece was much more behind on this animal thing than the rest of the world. Um, I, I had to visit someone in a, an apartment building. As I opened the door, um, uh, I came face to face with someone very abruptly. It was a woman and I felt kind of awkward and I said, good evening. And she didn't respond at all. Um, as soon as the door closed behind me, uh, I can hear her talking and I go up to the window that was there in the entrance of the uh, of the apartment building, and I can see that she's got this whole thing going on with a dog, a whole <laughs> conversation. I was like, oh, I didn't get to hear good evening, but this dog is uh, the recipient yeah. of this big conversation. Um, yeah, there's something wrong with us, certainly. <laughs> yeah, she was upset because you interrupted, you rudely interrupted, your grace rudely interrupted her conversation with her dog. Probably, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. There's a, there's a follow-up question I want to ask you. Um, so, so is the reason why, is it, is it basically pride? The reason why people do this, they, they put animals where they do in their lives. It's, it's our desire not to see our own problems that's my idea of it anyway um right like i said a, a dog or a cat will not point out my bad issues um it won't challenge anything i think uh, it won't examine my moral compass which um okay the first part of the reading is about having a moral compass um we don't like all of that challenge in our life but without that challenge um i don't think we're on the road to salvation at all Right. Now, there's there's going to be people that listen to this who are a, a little bit familiar with some of the lives of the saints, and they'll respond by saying, this is the kind of thing that I would have said when I was a catechumen. I would say something like, but what about all of the, like, the hermit saints and people who escaped other people to achieve holiness? Um, what's the explanation we give to people like that? I'm glad you asked that because I planned on mentioning it and I forgot. Um, first of all, uh, the, most of the hermits became hermits after having dwelt with uh, people and experienced uh, the humbling that it is to, to cut your will. Uh, and those few rare cases, um, there were reasons why a person had to run from everybody, like St. Mary of Egypt. Um, she was fighting her own um, fleshly right. battles. She had already lived too much people, and that was her way of salvation. But for the most part, um, I don't think many of us are in the situation that we've um, figured everything out. We've been so good with our fellow human beings. We've become so humble that we're ready to run off and become hermits. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else that Your Grace wants to add on that? I think it, I would like to open the floor up to some discussion on what Your Grace has just been talking about. But does Your Grace want to add anything else before we do that? No, I think I've said too much as is. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Yerada. And we'll first ask if we have, um, well, I have to be careful naming names here, um, but we'll ask our uh, our, our Orthodox um, Christians, our, our baptized people. Um, do you have anything, any questions or anything to say based on what Yerud has just um, spoken about? We'll open the floor to our catechumens um, and our inquirers too. Um, do we have, do any of you have any questions for the Espada or any comments on, um, well, actually, any questions is better. Do you have any of you have any questions about, on what the Espada has just spoken about? I have a question. Yes, Aaron. So 
I will not pray for my dog like I pray for a loved one. But when my dog died, I mourned my dog. What is to be said of that? Who is that coming back to me? Um, uh, I think losing losing anything is difficult. And certainly with animals, there, there, uh, there is a, a good uh, relationship. It's, um, we miss animals too. I admit to that. Um, I just uh, worry about people that um, have animals as their, um, as their soulmates. Um, there's a problem there, I think. But I mean, certainly one can miss an animal and one can uh, really feel the separation. Um, maybe there was too much of a relationship with the animal, but sometimes that just happens. And um, I think we've all felt that I was looking through some old photos on my phone the other day and I saw, the, saw a dog we had and I, I missed that dog. Uh, if I can, uh, I think Aaron, what and what Despot is, uh, what the point that Despot is making is that um, Despot is really talking about people making idols of animals. So, the f the first thing they do to make an idol of an animal is one, they use them as a replacement for for human contact. When, as Despot has said, the point of this life is to is to is to work out our kinks, it's to work out our salvation. And so by being in a community with other people, it's like it's like we're a rough ball of of granite or limestone or something. And the people around us, they're they're slowly polishing us. They're, when when our will interacts with their will, um, we're able to sacrifice our own will. And this is what Despot is saying that when you have an when you have an animal, it's you don't have to sacrifice any self-will for an animal at all. They don't challenge us in any way. The, the dog is just always happy to see you. It's always wagging its tail and whatever. But the, the, the animal doesn't have any concept of morality. It's it, every animal is just is really basically acting on the desires of their belly. Um, so what what people who who elevate animals do is they so they use them as a replacement for human contact. The other thing that they do is is they then start attributing all of these things to animals that they don't have. So they believe that their animal has free will. Like you go on YouTube and you search for guilty dog videos. My Like my dog's guilty. My dog knows that it's done something wrong. It's like your, your dog doesn't understand good and evil. So does that make sense? Like there's, so there's a, there's a fundamental delusion in all of this. Um, and it, and it, it it deprives for for everyone who does this. It deprives them of of this kind of refinement of themselves. It's these people aren't able to actually sacrifice their self will for anyone. If you if you can't sacrifice your self will, you can't be pleasing to man and you can't be pleasing to God. It's impossible. Um, did I speak well, Despada? Sounds like what I was trying to say and put much better than I did. All right. All right. Um, Aaron, did you have a follow up question on that? Yes, I just wanted to make a comment if if I may. Yeah, go for it. It's that um, Hinduism elevates animals and says that um, they are equal to humans or there is no special distinction. And, uh, right. and they also idolize and worship some animal the cow yeah i don't know best do you, does your grace have anything to say about that um it does scare me i don't like any animals to suffer and but it does scare me that uh animal rights are probably stronger than human rights i mean you can um and actually i'll confess that i really like uh animal videos i'm confessing to this um uh, Tijon already knows this but anyway um but the laws have become so complicated that um it's 
much scarier to do something wrong, I think, to an animal than to a human being. And and people are are more vicious, and that and that that becomes uh, the problem that um, uh, we see the animal as really um, whatever is closest to our soul, and that's because the humans disappoint us. Um, but we're meant to be disappointed in this life. We're meant to forgive. We're meant to start over. We're meant to excuse people's faults and to recognize our own faults. Um, I don't think a dog will ever point out my faults, but um, a yeah, dog can see me eating too much and not even look at me, whereas someone across the table might be like, whoa. Uh, so... Yeah, the the animals are better with us only because they have uh, a total um, lack of um, moral judgment, which uh, St. Philip says in the beginning. Let's um, let's go back to the to the the reading itself. Thank thank you, Vespertal. Um does anyone this but was there anything actually was there anything else that your grace wanted to highlight from from this chapter on conscience and moral response moral responsibility uh, there's a lot more there but um i think we understood all the other points um whoever wants to say something else is welcome yeah let's let's see if we have anyone uh, uh i'm, I'm going to use hmm. I'm toing and frying about whether or not I should use names. I've already uh, mentioned Aaron's name, but um, do we have any any of our baptized Orthodox that have any any questions or any comments on on this chapter? Okay, let's open the floor then to uh, our catechumens again. So, um, was there anything that anyone didn't understand? This some of this, especially the language, was was quite high level. Um, so is there anything that anyone wants us to, to try to explain from this chapter? Any questions at all? Okay, we're very quiet and shy today. So maybe we'll try and just recap this in, in maybe simpler terms. So what did we so what did Saint Philaret say that um, so animals don't have a concept of morality of, of good or evil? Um, animals act as their nature dictates or uh, or their training, if they've been trained. Um, so we can't say that a, a dog or a bear or a grasshopper or anything did something evil or, or good. That's something that we can only ascribe to uh, someone who has free will, um, which would be uh, us. Um, also, the, the demons and the angels, we can say that about. Um, how does a person distinguish between what's morally good and what's morally bad? Um, God has given us uh, a faculty in our soul to do this, and that's the conscience. The conscience acts in us as it's uh, as a voice which um, tells us, "You, this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do." Um, it also tells us, it alerts us, it rewards us when we do something good, morally good, and it punishes us, it, it accuses us when we do something that's morally bad. Um, and if a person does do something which is morally bad and they're feeling the uh, accusations of their conscience, the, the thing that they have to do if, if they don't want to fall into a, into a deep hole of despondency is they have to repent, they have to confess and, um, and change their behavior. Um, the other thing that St. Philaret said is that man can only be held responsible for his actions in two conditions. Um, the first is that he has to be in a conscious condition and he has to be free to, to choose to do what he's doing. So the example that St. Philaret gave was, uh, there were holy martyrs who, um, were, were, were incense was put in their hands and then their hands were forcibly put over flames and um, their torturers were hoping that they would um, drop the incense into the flame as an as an offering to their pagan idol um, but you couldn't even if even if those martyrs did drop the um, the incense you couldn't accuse those people of doing something evil because they were being forced against their will to do it um, 
so and and in terms of being conscious of of what you're doing well for example if you were if you were drugged against your will um and you committed some sin then i guess you you hmm, that's an interesting one you certainly wouldn't bear full moral responsibility for what you were doing um Yerida, what 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 i don't know does your grace have anything to say about that like if there's a scenario where someone is um that you've you've gone to the doctor and the doctor has accidentally given you three times your medication and you're you're kind of mentally out of it you don't know what you're doing and you fall into some sin i mean do you have any responsibility for what you've done or is it uh, i guess i don't i don't actually don't know the answer for this um i think we have um responsibility as far as um how much we were aware of the dangers of the place we were um, um, placing ourselves. I sometimes say to spiritual children that it rhymes in Greek, it doesn't rhyme in English though, that we need more um, uh, attention, attentiveness rather than prayer. Uh, not that prayer is not yeah. important, prayer is the most important part of our life perhaps, but even more so today we have to be attentive to what's going on around us, what's going on in our heart. Um, you can make a very big mistake just by not watching yourself, just by not being concentrated on what's going on, both inside you and outside you and around you. The conscience also gets sick and dies, and that's totally our responsibility. Um, when we accept small sins and uh, they don't pay our conscience, then we're on the road to doing bigger sins. Right. Right. And this is what your grace shared with us before about zeal in small matters. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so the, I guess the other caveat that, um, I don't know if the caveat's the right word, but the other thing that Saint Philaret highlighted was that so you must be conscious of what you're of what you're doing. Um, but what about the case of a drunkard? Well, the, the drunkard got drunk knowing the, that that they would put themselves into a drunk state. So that person is responsible for for their sin. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, we cannot say that. Um... It happened because, but who's the one that made us drunk? Or, uh, yeah, and it goes to a, a couple of other areas that too. And then the the final point, which I think is very important for all of us, is it's it, morality is universal to men. Every every single person has a conscience. They have some sort of uh, natural understanding of what's good and evil but it's not perfect and we only have you only find perfect morality in the true church of christ so outside of the church you still find uh you you find morality but you only find it in its very in a very rudimentary form is there anything your grace kind of wants to say about that i want to be careful talking about this i don't want to say something wrong I think that sounds pretty good to me. Okay. Okay. Glory to God. So with all of that said, um, let's just open the, the floor generally to, to, to questions again. Do we, is there anything else? Um, any, do we have any further discussion or questions from, from anyone, anyone on anything we've discussed? Okay, that's a no. I, what we, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Yes, so I might have a feeling that I have that I am committing a sin, perhaps a small sin continually. For like, I won't give an example, but um, sometimes I have read that perhaps the devil might be implanting an idea that what you are doing is sinful but it is not so how do i discern whether it is my conscience highlighting a true sin or whether it is the devil who is trying to tell me that i am sinning when i am not 
Hmm. I would probably say that that was an area that uh, we should um, address with our spiritual father, tell him what the thing is and if this is good or bad, um, if this is really a sin. Some people uh, also become hung up on very small things that I probably wouldn't consider really sinning. Um, and maybe the devil is diverting us from things that are worse that actually exist in our, in our life, but we don't see them because we're paying attention to something we shouldn't bother. Uh, anything else, Aaron, on that? Thank you. Um, if we, we've got a little bit more time on our hands. Um, does anyone have any, sorry, that's but I'm putting your grace on the spot here, but does anyone, while we have the that are on the line, um, does anyone just have any general questions that they want to ask um, the bishop while while we have his grace with us? Now's your opportunity in front of everyone and the whole internet. Yes, Lucas, please um, try to try to speak into your microphone if you okay, can. I'll try to speak louder and into the mic. Okay, let's put a, how does one act? What does one do if he has the feeling that his conscience is kind of numb or muted or not as loud as he wished that his inner guide would be. It is kind of a question. I don't know if it relates to the article on, on the uh, Western European Diocese website by um, by the the Russian bishop on, on the dead heart, if you know what I mean. I forgot the name of the bishop. Uh, Probably yes, it was. Um, no, the dead conscience is referring, I think, to uh, an article by Saint Ignatius de Anchanilnos. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Mm. Uh, yes, um, um, I would say that we need to be looking in the mirror as often as we can. And what is the mirror? The mirror is the writings and the lives of the saints. Um, because you look at how delicate the saints were um, in the reading was about the incense in the hand uh, that the saints wouldn't allow it to fall out of the hand so it wouldn't be uh, given over um, to the idols. So um, there are matters that are so delicate that um, our soul starts to get delicate again when we read all these things and we say, in what ways am I um, not honoring the Lord? In what ways am I not accepting my martyrdom? In what ways am I not taking up my cross daily? Uh, all these things, I think, um, give life to the conscience. They make the conscience breathe in deep again and, and start to work. Um, and on the other hand, we're in trouble when we say that um, that nothing around us is really um, really has anything to do with uh, my sins. Uh, I think the spiritual person, first of all, uh, looks at everything from from the corner of his own sinfulness. Um, this is this happened to me because I'm sinful. Um, I saw this week that um, uh, Kirill of Moscow uh, slipped up in and on getting up, it, it, it appears he reported that this is not from any uh, evil doing of mine. Um, <laughs> if you were a spiritual person, uh, Mr. Kierl, you would say that, of course, um, the Lord allowed this because I'm slipping many times in my life. But OK, he didn't want to see it that way and that I don't want to get into his <laughs> Right. His uh, realm of conscience. Um, Lucas, do you have any, any follow-up for Yerida? No, thank you, dear Bishop. I think the deeper parts is, is part for, for another time or more personal time. Thank you. Um, Vespata, do you, just on talking about the mirror, which is reading the the writings and the lives of the saints. Uh, for a spiritual beginner, does your grace have any recommendations for which lives of the saints people should should read? 
Mm. I think perhaps anyone should start with the martyrs for Christ to see um, how much they really loved Christ, how much that everything else in the world was nothing. Um, and in general, the lives of the saints, also the ascetical saints who did the same thing. Um, they had the bloodless martyrdom. They um, cut their will again. We're talking about will. And they uh, sought to follow everything that belonged to Christ. Christ was their everything. And on the the, the writings of the saints, Yerida, um Sorry, I'm putting your grace on the spot with these questions, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, is it for people these days, is it better for us to read the modern fathers? Is it better for us to read the, the early fathers? Um, does it matter at all? Um, first of all, uh, I think this goes without saying, uh, I in general hate any modern book. And when I spoke, speak about modern books, I'm talking about... Um, the mid and later parts of the 20th century up until today, um, because they're, they're the fruits of, for the most part, of people who, who have no experience in the real church. Um, but as far as the ancient fathers and the more modern fathers like St. Ignati, who I mentioned, and St. Uh, Theophant, um, I think a mix of both is good. Uh, I think there are times when our soul needs something refreshing that's kind of close to us, like St. Thelf on the recluse. And I think there are times that we have to go back to the very beginning and see what all the fathers spoke to us uh, in different uh, phases. So um, I think in order for us to have a healthy spiritual life, sometimes we don't feel like reading something heavy. Sometimes we don't feel like reading something like this. Sometimes we don't read, feel like reading something like that. But um, we should choose amongst the spiritual things something that, that feels good at the moment. Um, I don't feel like uh, watermelon tonight. I think I'll just eat peaches. Um, the, being the peaches and the watermelon, both being spiritual sources, um, rather than revert to something... Um, uh, totally worldly, we can uh, be inspired by something else, something that wasn't here today. And and the same thing uh, is in prayer. You know, I'm stuck on um, reading this today, um, but I would happily read the um, Sepulchratory Canon to the Mother of God. Do follow your heart a little um, keep your rule as far as that goes, but follow your heart a little for the rest of reading and praying. Right. And when your grace is saying about keeping your rule, your grace is talking about um, the rule of prayers that your spiritual father wants you to do every day and any um, daily readings that your spiritual father wants you to do. Exactly. Right. And I just want to go back to something your grace said about having a, a distaste for the modern fathers, because most of them were outside of the boundaries of the church. Your grace is obviously referring to people like the so-called, um, I don't even want to call him a saint, Elder Paisios of Athos, um, Elder Porfirios, uh, Elder Ephraim of Arizona, these kind of pseudo-Orthodox personalities. All these things, all these people, and for the most part, modern authors, they're um, who are trying to talk about any topic are talking about uh, talking from their own uh, their own um, their own head their own uh, uh, misled heart I mean even if they refer to fathers they might not really um, think that the opinion of the fathers is much more important than their own they write 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 books on this on that and I really wouldn't waste my time reading any of those books, even if they're not exactly Elder Paisus or Elder Porfirius. Um, yeah, they're, who is he? Who is giving me something? Uh, what, right. um, what fountain am I drinking from? Right, right. Um, so, but where, I guess I'm, uh, but so I, I don't want to, um, 
someone like Archbishop Averki, for example, your your Grace isn't isn't talking about someone like Archbishop Averki when your Grace is discussing this now, right? Certainly not. Certainly not. Right. Not those those few examples in our times. Um, even if they're not proclaimed saints, they were people uh, who kept the church going, like Saint Philaret too, because he was in in our days, at least my days. I'm not uh, a kid to say that I was born uh, after he left this world. No, that's not the truth. Um, uh, they were they were the the few examples of today. And yes, I should have made that clear that what they wrote was well founded in the fathers, um, but they had the grace of God to explain the fathers. And for us who don't have the grace of God, at least we can um, use the fathers a lot. Um, someone in one of his beautiful emails that uh, tells um, some stories about me anyway, he said that I wrote the article on Heliasm and it was totally unacceptable because it was all quotes from the Holy Fathers. Well, I don't have anything else to offer. What can I say? Um, those Holy Fathers yeah. are the only ones that um, can settle matters for me. And I certainly wouldn't pretend to know something they don't know or to be able to explain to people other than pointing out this father said this, this father said that, that father said that, and put them in a kind of collection, which is what I did on the article of Heliasm. Right, right. There's a there's a name that I want to mention, but I, uh, who a certain uh, American uh, writer who was very very famous and very popular amongst the world Orthodox, but I don't know if it's good for me to mention his name. And this is the person that's coming to my mind when your Grace is talking about um, people who had their own ideas. Um, oh, there are a lot of those such people today. I, I doubt it would hurt if you named one of them. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about. Uh, Father Seraphim Rose, uh, who, especially towards his later years, wrote some very, very strange things, some unorthodox things. Um, specifically, his his teaching on the so-called royal path is 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 not orthodox. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think we want to to make people into saints, and then we want um, to make dogma from what they said rather than from what was um, uh, said from old. So, yes, this is a, a danger. Um, there was a young man that both I and Father Istvan spoke with in the past, and um, he came up in the end, and after quite a bit of work on uh, directing him, and he said, well, you people are not the church because you don't agree with uh, Father Seraphim Rose. Um, Father Seraphim Rose wrote some very nice things, but that uh, that doesn't mean that everything he wrote was dogma of our church. Um, I think towards the end of his life, he was um, very much in danger of where the boundaries of the church were. Um, he started to go... Um, try to go opposite to Father Pandaleman of Boston and uh, going opposite to someone too much uh, can bring you away from where you should really be. All right. He lost track of his real enemy? Yes, exactly. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Despota. Um, we're going to we're gonna have everyone on the line, but I'm just going to stop the recording here because we're at 45 minutes.